following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The science of Gnosis is a very particular form of knowledge that guides us in the process of transforming our life. This is the very purpose of the Gnostic teachings. The reason behind all of the activity of the many spiritual messengers who have come to humanity has been to give us practical guidance so that we can transform our lives. It has not been so that we can merely believe or play games with our intellect to merely theorize. But instead, all the great religions have been given to us as a gift in order to help us overcome suffering to give us practical tools that we can use in order to find the truth and to find what real happiness is. And this is why we study Gnosis. If we study a religion or this Gnostic teaching and lose sight of this essential foundation, then we are on a mistaken path. When we merely intellectualize or debate or simply believe but do not practice, then we're on a mistaken path. This becomes easy for us to see when we analyze the nature of existence, how existence functions. And we can only know that through our own experience. When we look at life, we see that life really is just a series of transformations. Life proceeds and develops by means of transformation. Everything is in continual change, and nothing is exempt from this. There is nothing in existence that is stagnant or static or motionless. The state of existence requires change. There's no way around this. This is basic physics. What we fail to remember 
what we fail to grasp is that we ourselves are undergoing continual change, continual transformation. But in what way? How are we continually changing is what escapes our perception. And this is because we still lack the capacity to perceive directly how we are changing. And this is because our consciousness is asleep. Therefore, we arrive at the reason for all of the great messengers to emphasize the need to awaken. Repeatedly in the Gospels of Jesus, we see, wake up, awaken, sleep not. We see this throughout the teachings of any great messenger. And what needs to awaken in us is our consciousness. And this is what we fundamentally ignore. When the consciousness begins to awaken by means of our will, through practical effort that we make from moment to moment, we put ourselves in a position to begin to learn about how we ourselves are transforming from moment to moment. And that activity of self-observation or watchfulness initiates a process of transformation but it cannot fully develop it on its own. In other words, to be watchful of oneself is the beginning, but it is not everything. In psychology, Gnostic psychology, esoteric psychology, we learn different tools in order to study ourselves. Self-observation and self-remembering are one of the basic tools that we use in order to begin to understand Gnosis. And as I mentioned, it is the beginning and not everything. So for us to begin to comprehend what Gnosis is, we have to begin observing ourselves, remembering ourselves, watching our own mind continually. And this is a place to start. If you haven't already studied self-observation, then you should do so. Study what that means, but most of all, begin practicing it and never stop practicing it. This is an effort, an activity that we have to continually renew until we perfect it. And this does not come in a matter of hours or even a matter of weeks. It takes a lifetime or more. This sense of inner watchfulness begins to show us the depth and complexity of our psyche, the many contradictions that we have within. And it can be an overwhelming realization to see how asleep we really are. It can be an overwhelming realization to see how strong the ego is in us. And self-observation can be exhausting because our consciousness is weak. We haven't exercised our consciousness, and thus it doesn't have the strength to be continually active. This is why we need to continually revive it, to keep activating the consciousness so that it will become strong. And we have many exercises and practices that we use in order to aid the consciousness in its process of awakening. Meditation is the most important one. But there are additional practices like pranayama or sexual transmutation. 
the use of mantra or various exercises like the Tibetan exercises or runic practices. All of these aid in giving strength to the consciousness so that we can make it more and more active. And really, this needs to be our foundation. We don't simply do all these practices to, quote, get experiences or to impress others or to look like a very serious Gnostic. We do these practices to strengthen our consciousness so that we can observe ourselves. So that we can learn about ourselves. So that we can change. When we take a look at our psychology, Gnosis teaches us that we have three brains. And we study those three brains, especially in self-observation, to learn how they function and how they misfunction according to our use of them. And we learn about the different bodies of the soul. We learn about not only how the physical body works, but how it is enlivened and given its life by the vital body. And how that in turn is influenced by the astral and mental bodies. And we learn how all of these vehicles interrelate with our three brains. And all of that we place in the context of Kabbalah in order to see the structure and understand how they relate. And all of these things are important and essential and we need them. But without the foundation of self-transformation, it is all a waste of time. In our day-to-day -day existence, in our moment-to-moment -moment life, what we seek is to change, to transform our lives, and in turn, to help make this a better world. This is why we have Gnosis. This is why these beautiful teachings have been granted to us in spite of our faults and our defects and our crimes. Therefore, we are with a heavy responsibility to utilize Gnosis in the right way and to actualize it, to realize it in our own hearts and minds. And then to do that, we need to keep this foundation in mind and not become distracted by all the many subtleties and difficulties of the knowledge or the politics or the distractions of material existence. Our comforts and securities in the world. All of these things pass away. Schools, Gnostic schools or religions, will die. Our physical body will die. Material existence itself will pass away. But our consciousness will persist. What counts is what we've done with our consciousness, how much we've developed it, awakened it, and strengthened it, and made it shine. This is why it's so important for us to be constantly and continually watchful of ourselves, to see that the way we're using our energy is feeding the development of our consciousness. And so here we arrive at an important aspect of this teaching. We can observe our organism or our existence in this material world and see that really this body of ours is more is similar to a factory 
with three levels. And on the ground level of this factory, we take in food and water in order to feed our machine to give it fuel and energy, to give it health. And we eat and we drink every day in order to produce a transformation. When we take in the raw elements of fruit and vegetables and grain and meats and water, our physical body through its bewildering intelligence, transforms all of those forms of matter into energy and other forms of matter, which sustain our physical vehicle and give us health according to how well we eat and drink. Of course, now we've become habituated to eating garbage, to eating a lot of chemicals and synthetic foods which contain no real vitality. And because of that, the vitality of our physical bodies is in decline. Nonetheless, if we are vigilant and willing to renounce all of those synthetic and fake forms of food, we can still take in healthy material for our physical well-being and our mental well-being. On the second level of this factory, of this machine, we take in air. We breathe. And the air that we absorb sustains our existence. In fact, this second level is even more important than the bottom level. We can live without food for a period of time. We can even go without water for a period of time. But we cannot go without air for very long at all. And of course, now in these times, we also have become habituated to inhaling and transforming very impure air, such that now people prefer the air in cities or in bars or in clubs. And when they smell fresh air, they feel weird. Or we become habituated to smoking which fills the lungs with an incredible amount of toxic material, which poisons the organism and the mind. When we study the Gnostic tradition, the practical teachings, we're informed about these first two levels, that in relation with food and water, we should try to eat the purest food we can and eat it consciously attentively. And we refer to the traditions amongst very serious spiritual practitioners who would not hold conversations while eating, who would pray while eating in order to fully consciously transform their food. And we learn mantras for that. Likewise, in relation with air, we learn how to watch our breath to pay attention to our process of breathing. And we learn practices like anapana, which is a very ancient traditional form of concentration based on an observation of the breath. And we learn pranayama, where we harness the vital forces that are in the atmosphere in order to consciously absorb those energies through our energetic channels and through the lungs. And in all of these methods, the goal is to strengthen the consciousness, to give pure energy so that our consciousness will have 
a very robust presence and be able to observe and watch with great attentiveness. That is why we learn all of these things. It's not simply to imitate others or to have some kind of ecstatic experiences or very pleasant experiences. It is to strengthen our consciousness so we can learn and change. On the third level of this factory, we find the most important transformation of all. The transformation of impressions. Many become bewildered when they hear about the transformation of impressions. What this phrase means is that all of the imagery, the sensory data that comes in through our five senses, we call them impressions, need to be transformed consciously. And this is a very challenging concept for us to grasp. It seems subtle. It seems elusive. It's here that we can get stuck or confused in a theory or philosophy, especially when we hear what Samael Anvior pointed out repeatedly in his books, that life does not exist except in how we perceive it. Life is not how we think it is. In fact, we only see our impressions of life. We don't see life as it is. When we observe nature, we see a tree or a plant. We don't see that tree or plant as it actually exists. What we see is our impression of it. This is a very important concept for us to perceive directly for ourselves, to experience. And if we really reflect on our own experience of life, we'll find that we have experienced it but never took it seriously. As an example, you may have seen a person, not known them, but seen them around, maybe at work or at school or in your neighborhood. And that image and maybe sound that you receive from that person, you interpret. Maybe you don't like them. Maybe something about them offends you or discourages you or disgusts you. Right there, you have transformed your impression, but based on what? How did you interpret that image or those sounds? Later, you may discover You may hear something else about that person that contradicts your impression. That maybe they are actually a really good person. Maybe you meet them and discover they're actually a really good person. And you discover that your impression of them was wrong. This very simple example is happening in us continually. Everything that we perceive through our five senses is received and transformed. But unfortunately, we don't transform those impressions with awareness, consciously. We simply receive them and react, and receive them and react continually. And we don't even know why we react the way we do. Reactions just emerge as if spontaneously from within us. We don't see the impression come in, we don't see the impression transform, and we don't see the reaction that's produced until it's already manifesting.
In the revolution of the dialectic, Samael Onvior explains by means of example. If we imagine a lake, a very calm, serene, smooth lake, and we throw a rock into that lake, the rock is the data coming from the exterior world. When the rock strikes the surface of the water, that is the impression striking our senses. And the waves are the reactions of the mind. If you've ever tried to meditate, you've seen for yourself that the mind is turbulent. That the mind is churning with waves that come from every which way without any consistency or predictability and seemingly without anything that you can do about it. So many try to learn to meditate and give up when they face this obstacle. The solution is to learn to transform impressions consciously. When we do that, when we are attentive and observing our experience from moment to moment, and impressions arrive to our senses, we receive them consciously and transform them in the moment consciously, then no reaction is produced in the mind. Then the mind calms down naturally on its own. Then when we meditate, the mind is quiet. It's very simple in theory, but challenging to do in daily life. Precisely because we become identified with impressions. Impressions that come from the outside world and from the inside world. When we awaken in the morning and we begin to go through our list of things that we have to do, things that we're worried about, our anxiety level begins to rise. And this produces reactions in the mind. Our thoughts and our feelings produce impressions. And then when we encounter our spouse or our roommates or our neighbors, or we go to work or to school, and we start to face all the challenges of the day, we become irritated, we become very excited, very happy. We pass through all the variety of events and states that occur to us during the day, we forget ourselves. We become identified. We become mechanical. And we go from event to event without any self-awareness whatsoever, merely reacting and reacting and reacting. Then at the end of the day, we're exhausted, the mind full of the impressions of the day, full of conflicts, worries, and doubts. If, however, we awaken in the morning and we meditate, we set the stage for a different way of experiencing our life. And by meditation, I mean we calm the mind. We still the mind. We activate the consciousness to observe, to be serene. And when we go about our business, we continue our meditation all day watchful and observant within this body and absorbing all the impressions of life with great attentiveness. In this way, even if someone curses at us, yells at us, says something obscene, we can receive that impression and not be disturbed. 
It may sound impossible, but if you make the effort, you can have that experience to see how if you don't place value on the words of a person, then those words will have no impact on you. The reason you become affected by what people say is because you have put a value on their words. The reason you really want the new iPhone is because you put a value on it in your mind. But if you were to see that device for what it is, merely a device, and something impermanent, something truly inconsequential in the big picture, then that longing, that desire will not disturb you. In fact, it might vanish altogether. The same is true for anything in life. The impressions of life agitate, excite, disturb, or entrance us precisely because of the value we place on them. If we extract that value, if we take it back, then those impressions remain as what they truly were in the beginning, empty, insubstantial. This is why all the great religions have said and repeated that life is an illusion, that life is maya, the illusion or the illusory display of the gods. This is not something that we can simply accept intellectually or believe in as a believer. We have to experience it. The illusion of life is created in our mind, not outside. We create that. We create our own illusion because of the value we place in impressions. Because of the false value we place there. Our experience of life is determined by how we transform impressions. If you want to boil it all down to one thing, that's it. If we are a negative person, a morbid person, so what some might call a pessimist or critical or sarcastic, it's our own fault because of how we transform the impressions of life. We choose to experience life that way. Thus, we have to ask ourselves sincerely, how can I change if I'm already choosing to be this way? It's astonishing to discover students of religions or even Gnosis who are well educated who really understand intellectually their teaching, but who are easily angered, who can become enraged or offended, or who are very negative, always attacking, always critical, always complaining. What this points out to us 
is that although that person may have an intellectual grasp, they don't have a practical experience. of how to transform their life. If they did, they would not become angry. Many of the greatest masters are illiterate, are not intellectual, and don't have everything memorized. But they're great masters precisely because they know how to transform from moment to moment, to have a receptive mind, to not be attached to anything, even a belief or a school or a religion. The power to transform life is in the transformation of impressions. We don't realize how important and how powerful this level of our factory truly is. Even though we live within its clutches from moment to moment. As I said, we can live without food or water for a time. We can go without air for a few seconds, maybe for some people a few minutes. But we can't go without impressions for even an instant. And this is because the consciousness itself is a natural transformer of impressions. That is its function. If the consciousness has no impressions to receive, then the consciousness cannot be. If the consciousness is here, then it perceives. Wherever that consciousness may manifest, its simple manifestation causes the arisal of impressions. Even if someone doesn't have a physical body, even if you're in the astral plane or the causal plane, you have to transform impressions. In fact, if you've had experiences out of the body, then you've undoubtedly experienced that what will kick you out of that experience is a bad transformation of an impression. And students who study astral projection, dream yoga, inevitably have this experience that as soon as they awaken consciousness in the astral world, they become so excited that they pop right back out and into the physical body. And this is because they did not transform the impression of arriving in the astral plane. They became identified. So transformation of impressions affects every dimension, not just the physical one. And when we say that it's based on how data arrives to the senses, it's not merely the physical senses. It's all the senses, all 12. The senses of each body receive information, and that information has to be transformed consciously. In our daily life, we constantly seek impressions. And we don't even realize that we do it. Why else do we pick the television shows that we do? Why do we pick the friends that we pick? Why do we choose the books that we choose to read? Or the magazines? Or video games? Or going to certain places? It's because we like the impressions that we get from those people or places or things. They provide food for some psychological element in us. So now we have to start asking ourselves, what am I feeding? 
when I go to that website or I go to that magazine stand or this bookstore or I go visit these friends what am I feeding with these impressions The answer will probably disturb us much of the time. If we're really sincere and really observing ourselves, we can start to see that humanity is addicted to pornography, to violence, to cruelty. And we're addicted to those things by taking them in as impressions. And what's most interesting is to reflect on how humanity justifies these behaviors. People justify the violence in movies and televisions and video games and say, well, it's a catharsis for the mind, for instinct, which has the instinct to violence. So when we express or utilize that violence through watching TV or movies or video games, then we express that energy so it doesn't have to come out physically. This is how people justify it. What they fail to realize is that the impressions have more impact on us than the physical act. People ignore the power of impressions and justify. We justify our addictions to certain kinds of impressions. Some students even come to Gnosis and study these teachings and even practice, but remain addicted to impressions and refuse to change that. Some are addicted to the impressions of intellectualism of constantly reading or studying or comparing different teachings. Some become addicted to the impressions of being an instructor or a leader, of trying to impress people, of trying to make people admire them or be envied by others. Some remain addicted to pornography and justify it saying they're using pornography to learn about their lust. Some remain addicted to video games with the same excuse, that they use video games to train their consciousness to kill the ego. So we justify our addictions in many ways. Some remain addicted to the impressions of gossip and justify themselves in different ways, why they need to gossip or hear about gossip. All of us have addictions to impressions. And what we don't realize is, in the same way that we become what we physically eat, we also become what we psychologically eat. We prefer to deceive ourselves with this notion that the mind is a separate entity and we can put into it whatever we want and there will be no consequence whatsoever. We love this notion because it gives us a big excuse to think about, to fantasize about, to indulge in anything that we desire. But let me tell you, this is a lie. The impressions that we take in transform and become part of us. They become part of our soul, our psyche. If you want to know why humanity is on the brink of destruction, it's because of this. It's because humanity is addicted to negative impressions and become so habituated to negative impressions that we lose all moral value. 
We lose all sense of what is truly right and wrong because the consciousness goes deeper and deeper to sleep and becomes more and more trapped in lies. This is how we see in different parts of the world the spread of terrible crimes. Crimes against children that are unmentionable but are happening now precisely because of the poisons put into the minds of men and women that they take in of their own will. Poisons like pornography, like violence. We are so addicted to enjoying impressions in our mind that we've become habituated to crime. And now we celebrate crime. I don't mean crime just in the sense of stealing from one another. I mean crimes against nature. Crimes against the cosmos. Crimes against the soul. Did you know that sarcasm is a form of violence? That when we are sarcastic, we commit an act of violence in the mental world. When we joke and throw arrows at each other, just playing, we actually create harm. But we celebrate this. We enjoy it. We enjoy the impressions of being cruel to each other. And we laugh it off like it doesn't mean anything. When in fact, we are injuring each other. And this is a minor thing in comparison with all the other things that we do. The key then to change this is to place a watcher at the gate of the mind, a guardian a warrior who will not miss anything, but who will continually watch for the impressions and will act as a guide for the consciousness to make good choices. To begin to select impressions this is what the serious Gnostic student does. The serious Gnostic student selects impressions in the same way that we select the best vegetables at the market, or we select the best meat or the best water. We don't go and look for dirt, for poison, for filthiness to put in the mind, to put in the heart. Instead, the serious Gnostic student will select, will seek out good impressions, healthy impressions. But most of all, this guardian or watcher has to transform every impression that arises because we cannot control everything that happens outside of us. We cannot. Some of us try and become very frustrated to control everyone in our lives, to control our spouse, to control our boss, to control everything outside in order to avoid certain kinds of impressions that we don't want. This is not the way. The way is through controlling oneself. Controlling our consciousness. When our consciousness is receptive, awake, active, and watching, and in complete control of our three brains, whatever impression arises and passes through our senses, passes through that lake of our example and does not leave a ripple. It's almost magical. 
that an impression can come right through us. And we remain attentive and serene. Even if that impression was one of violence, horror, crime. Thus we can comprehend on this basis how it is that Jesus was upon the cross, tortured and being killed, and yet remained serene and prayed for his persecutors. This is because of his mastery of the transformation of impressions. Likewise, examples of the Buddha or of Krishna facing a great enemy or a great challenge and remaining serene with an attitude of love. One of the great postulates that Samael Ambior gave to us that can help us with this is this quote. One must learn to receive the unpleasant manifestations of others with gratitude. Now that's a very interesting idea and one could debate it and philosophize about it for hours, but that is useless. What is effective is to use it, to consciously receive anything from our neighbor with gratitude. If our friend or our spouse becomes upset, becomes angry, normally those impressions strike our mind and produce big waves. And we get angry right back. We match each other. And we raise the level on each other. One gets mad, the other gets more mad. And it just gets worse. This is how we commonly react. Of course, we may not be the person who expresses that anger outside. We might express that anger in a passive way. Nonetheless, we react, whether internally or externally. If instead we can learn to use this postulate, and we receive those impressions from our friend or our spouse who's so angry with us. And consciously we receive that and realize, I need to be grateful for this. I need to comprehend why I'm receiving this impression. Maybe it's my karma. Maybe I truly made a mistake. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I need to listen and understand the point of view of my friend or my spouse who I claim to love. And really, this is the most interesting thing. We claim to love and appreciate our friends and to love and value our spouse. But when they come to us with a complaint, we don't want to hear it. We consider ourselves to be little angels who've, who've fluttered down onto the planet to grace everyone else with our presence. It's one of the many lies we tell ourselves, that we're good. Instead, we should be grateful for that opportunity to see ourselves through the eyes of another person because let me tell you, no one sees us the way we see ourselves. This is why a spouse or a friend is so valuable. And we should be so grateful that they're willing to put up with us. In those instances of conflict, 
of difficulty, of adversity, is the best time to learn what we need to change to make life better, not only for ourselves, but for the ones that we claim to love. What we fail to realize in those moments is that we are making someone suffer. Yet we get angry and defend and justify our causing them suffering. We don't want to hear that we were mistaken, that we were rude or crude or violent or thoughtless or whatever it is, selfish. We don't want to hear any of that because we believe we're saints. This is the problem. But if we can re learn to receive those impressions gratefully, serenely, there's an enormous chance to redirect our life, to become a better person, to be a better husband or wife. This is what it means to receive with gratitude the unpleasant manifestations of our fellow man. And this applies to everything in life. If someone at work is giving us a hard time or yelling at us, or someone in our school or group or class, these are opportunities for us to change. If someone doesn't like us, or is always rude to us, or sarcastic with us, be grateful for that. And this is the greatest joy of a serious Gnostic student, is to discover their own mistakes. That is why we study Gnosis, to learn how to change. By means of that grateful reception, the conscious reception of those impressions, we have the chance to change ourselves, to become better people. And in this way, we can have an impact on our world. If we can change as individuals, then our society can change as well. If we stop consuming the impressions of violence, if we stop consuming the impressions of pornography, then those industries will have no customers and they will die. But unfortunately, those industries are the largest in the world. Pre precisely because people think they can consume those products psychologically without any adverse effect. That is why our world is falling into decay. For the serious Gnostic student, the person who sincerely wants to change their life, the transformation of impressions is the key. It is important for us to learn to transmute our sexual energy. Because without this, the consciousness cannot grow. This is the very basis of the entire teaching. To enter into transmutation. Without that, one cannot have anything. Because one throws away the very essence of the soul, of Christ. But upon that foundation of transmutation, we then need to work with the consciousness actively and diligently. And here's the reason why. We begin to conserve and manage enormous amounts of energy. If we are not transforming impressions consciously, then that energy will be misused by the ego. This is why Samael and Vior emphasized in the major mysteries. One who studies Gnosis will either become an angel or a demon. There's no other outcome. There's no middle way there. And it's precisely because we harness so much energy. But who is using it is what we need to know. 
Who is using our energy? Who is transforming impressions in us? When we go through life mechanically and we receive the impressions of life mechanically, automatically, just going along, who is receiving those impressions and transforming those impressions in combination with the energy we've been saving? The ego. The ego, lust, anger, envy, pride. Then we don't get better, we get worse. We get worse. We, we fortify the ego when that happens. You see, in every moment, something is being created in us. Life is not static. Everything is continually changing. Everything. Our mind, our heart, our soul, our body are continually changing in every instant. When we remain asleep, we are devolving. In the revolution of the dialectic, Samuel M. Vior states, when there is no transformation of impressions, one is devolving. It's unequivocal. There's no option. There's no alternative. In order to transcend suffering, in order to awaken the consciousness and ascend into superior levels of being, we must consciously transform impressions as much as we can, continually. Having said that, we also have to understand the level that we're in. Transformation of impressions is not something that you will master in a few days, nor in a few years. In fact, the only one who can perfectly transform impressions immediately in the moment they arrive is a fully awakened master. Before that level, we make mistakes. There are mistransformations that happen precisely because the ego is still alive. Those mistakes may not always be physical. They may be internal. Nonetheless, we need to make the effort until we reach that level. The transformation of impressions is the way we transform our life. The way we consciously harness the energy that explodes in the moment when impressions arrive into us and meet the psyche. There are great forces in a process of combustion inside of our factory. And when we apply our conscious will onto that, we can extract those forces in order to learn, in order to grow. When we have the challenge, which we all face, of seeing a person who stimulates our lust, right there we know we need to transform the impression. And not just indulge in that impression and feed the lust. But we consciously have to take that situation and turn it around. To merely observe ourselves is only the beginning. To even know that we need to transform that impression, we need to have been observing ourselves. Otherwise, we would automatically transform that impression into lust. 
and we would create a new I in the mind and trap ourselves more in suffering and mechanicity. So mere self-observation is the first part, to be aware of ourselves and see an impression of lust. But you cannot stop there, nor can you simply pray for God to save you, to take away the impression. There's no knowledge gained there. There's no wisdom earned. There's no consciousness awakened when you do that. What you have to do in those instances is to perceive why the lust is harmful. To perceive how your consciousness is on the edge of that cliff. On the edge of falling into that abyss of desire. And you need to feel that terror of feeling the consciousness about to be swallowed by yet another desire. And we have to turn that around. There are many ways to do this, but none of them come through avoidance of the impression or suppression of the impression. Instead, we have to remain indifferent. neither indulging in it or running from it. There are some groups who teach to indulge in that desire, to enjoy it, to indulge it. And that way, they claim, you harness the forces and come closer to God. This is a lie. This is called black magic, black tantra. And there are other groups who teach to avoid that impression, to run away from it, to call upon God to save you, and to run as fast as you can away from that desire. This is mere suppression or avoidance. It goes nowhere because that desire remains alive in the mind. We have no understanding of that desire, and thus we have no knowledge of it, and thus we remain trapped in ignorance. The way to transform any impression is to be in the middle, neither craving nor avoiding, neither indulging or repressing, but being there consciously and comprehending. When that lustful image comes into the mind and we see that person, We're not concerned about that person at all to really transform the impression. We're concerned with our reaction to how we're taking that image in. When we observe that image arriving into the mind, by consciously receiving that, we can apply the force of the teachings of the knowledge of our comprehension, our understanding. As an example, you can see that person, let's say you're a man and you see a woman and you feel that lust. An immediate way to dispel that force is to remember your mother or your sister or your divine mother, best of all. And to realize you need to have that same attitude of respect and modesty towards every woman. The same attitude you have towards your own mother, your own sister, your divine mother, you should have that to other women. To not look at them lustfully, but to treat them like a sister. Like someone who is pure and deserves respect. That has a lot of power. This is a way that we use our three brains in a positive way. To consciously think those things, to consciously feel the love we have for our divine mother or our physical mother 
or our sister. And in turn, to consciously transform the event. This can never happen mechanically. It can never happen automatically. Don't develop the concept that you can sort of figure out how these things work and then you'll just automatically do it from now on. It doesn't work like that. Gnosis is not mechanical. The awakening of consciousness is not mechanical. It is not automatic. Just because intellectually you may have figured something out does not mean consciously that you're doing it. It takes constant, constant effort, consciously. And we can apply a similar technique to any impression that arises, whether the impression is positive, according to us, or negative, according to us. We have to transform all impressions. So a way to begin this is at the end of every day to take a few minutes, sit in a very comfortable place, relax, and look back on your day. Reflect on those moments when you felt a change in your mood or your attitude. When something shifted for you. And reflect on those moments and look for what impression caused that change. That may be a change towards a negative state or even to an identified state that we would call positive. Like maybe we became really excited, too excited. Anything that leads us to be identified, we need to look for that and reflect on the impression that caused that change. Then we need to start analyzing what was happening in our mind, in our three brains, reflecting on this. When this certain event happened, what did I think? What did I feel? What did I see? What did I hear? The best guide to this practice is your intuition. Listen to your heart. Your heart will lead you directly to the thing that you need to work on if you listen to your intuition. Most of the time, though, we don't really want to find the problem. And so instead, we listen to the mind. And we're trying to remember, what did that guy say in the lecture about this or about that? Or what is the opposite of what so-and-so said to me? How do I use the second jewel of the yellow dragon and the battle of the opposites? What is the opposite of him saying this or that? And we get caught in this intellectual debate. This is not the way to resolve the conflict. We resolve it intuitively. In those moments of reflection, you should also pray and ask for the help of your Divine Mother. It's through her intercession and her assistance that we can successfully terminate the egos that cause the problem. We need to do this type of activity every day. To every day reflect on the things that changed our mood or our attitude, things that affected us, where we became identified. And we need to discover what bad transformation did we make and how can we fix it. And I would suggest that you take it another step. And when you reflect upon the mistake that you may have made, the bad transformation that you made, also pray to your Divine Mother to show you how you should have behaved. Ask for the guidance of God to show you what would have been the right thing to do. 
And in that way, you can arrive at the synthesis, a conscious comprehension, real understanding. This topic of the transformation of impressions has a lot of details, and it takes a lot of study and practice to get it. You can learn a lot by studying the revolution of the dialectic, in which Samuel M. Vior explains this repeatedly in different ways. Do you have any questions? transform our impressions, if we don't, you know, die, if we don't kill off the ego with the help of our divine mother, then anything that we do, such as the vocalizations, the transmutation, um, the exercises, the other exercises, it will convert us into demons, powerful demons, correct? That's right. Unfortunately, because of our pride, thinking that we know everything once we've studied a couple of books. And because of our ignorance, we fail to um, put into activity the consciousness in the right way. What happens is that people will study this teaching or other similar teachings and do all the practices, meditate, even transmute their sexual energy but because they don't work on the ego in the right way, in a serious way, they awaken negatively. And even during um, the 60s and 70s, when Sama El Enviro was teaching in Latin America, he commented about this specifically and said, unfortunately, many students were coming out of South America and Latin America awakening negatively, many of his students because of this. So what about now? It's a big problem. It's a problem of pride. Many think that because they've studied some books or because they studied with such and such a person that they have the express train to realization and thus they will just naturally awaken consciousness in the right way. They don't really study. They don't really get into the details especially of the, their own mind. And there are many who talk about the ego and talk about meditation and talk about transformation, but who are asleep. And there are some who even are awakening consciousness, but in the wrong way, in a negative way. And for us who are students, who are asleep and who are just sincerely trying to make effort, we can't discriminate between all these different types of people. This is part of the reason why Samael and Vior said, do not follow anyone except your own inner being. So yes, the danger is there, but that danger exists in any religious tradition. It doesn't matter. Don't be scared off by Gnosis just because of that statement. It's true of any religion. Well, it's a very good question. It's a long question. It's a good one. Um, from what I understood from the question is uh, there is a great danger for a student to think that they are transforming when instead they are still indulging or even repressing. And yes, that is absolutely true. But there is no sure antidote except experience. 
We have to teach ourselves how to transform impression. There's no trick. There's nothing you can memorize in your intellect that will be a sure guide to transforming any impression. The only way to do it is to be consciously active continually. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, that you get into a conversation with someone that takes a turn for the worst. And let's say you're somewhere that you can't get out of, maybe in a car or on a bus or at work. Maybe you're in a meeting with your boss and your boss starts talking about stuff that you really don't want to talk about, very negative things. What are you going to do? If it's your boss especially, you have to be attentive because if you space out, you could get fired. The answer is to be conscious, to be respectful, to listen, but to not indulge. The mind becomes conflicted about this because the mind wants a concrete A or B. Do I do this or do I do that? But let me tell you, transformation of impressions is not the domain of the mind. Transformation of impressions is the domain of the consciousness who can use the mind but is not dependent on the mind. And this is something you can only see from your own experience. And you will see it. Life is very challenging in these times. Our karma is very heavy. All of us are facing situations that are challenging and painful and difficult. Each of us has to learn for ourselves. How do we act? How do we behave? How do we transform this for the greater good? You can only learn that at the feet of your inner master, who will teach you if you listen. And what I said about going by the guidance of your intuition in meditation applies to the transformation of impressions. I was just giving you some examples, very crude ones. But in the moment of transforming impressions, you have to listen to your intuition as to how to do it. Don't get stuck in the mind, the mind which compares that wants definition or, or a concrete, do this, don't do that. If you get stuck in the mind, then you can no longer receive the impression consciously. What happens is then you just start thinking, comparing, analyzing, getting scared, getting afraid, getting worried, no longer transforming consciously. Then you're taking all that energy into your fear, into your worry, into your frustration. Right? Be conscious. Be aware. How do you both not allow an impression to enter your mind, but at the same time not to run away from it or suppress it? How do you both take in the impression and not take it in? Is that the question? Not allow the impression to enter your psyche. To not allow it to enter the psyche. Well, let me, let me answer that by means of an analogy. When I talked about selecting impressions in the same way that we select food in the market, we have to do the same thing in life. Many cases where we wrongly transform impressions, we put ourselves there because we're ignorant. That's the first thing. To not put yourself in a position of having to take in bad things. For example, don't eat garbage. Simple. But we do it with impressions. We choose to take them in. That's the first thing. Stop choosing to take in garbage. That's the main thing. Secondly, if we find ourselves in a situation where we, are in, we feel the danger of becoming identified, the first thing you have to do is relax. Because if you become tense or anxious or afraid, you'll repress or run away. The transformation of impressions is based in being very relaxed and very attentive. The next thing is, how do you 
take that in or avoid taking that in or not suppress or all these other aspects of it. Don't worry so much about it. Relax and pay attention. Listen to your intuition. Listen to your heart. Don't get so rigid. We have to relax and listen and pay attention. And whatever impressions come, transform them. Consciously. Not with the mind. It's not an easy thing to explain. Our language does not transform or does not transmit how to utilize consciousness. Our language is too crude for that. If, for example, somebody is saying something offensive and you have no choice but to be there, you will know that you're indulging in it in the same way that you know you're eating food. You chew it. You chew on it. If an impression comes in and you're chewing on it, meaning you're repeating it over and over in your mind, you're replaying it, you're analyzing it, you're saying, oh, I can't believe they said that. You are indulging. If, on the other hand, you simply let that impression go right by and you keep paying attention, it passes right through you. It leaves no wake, no waves. You'll still remember that it happened, but you won't be digesting it. You won't be chewing on it continually in your mind. The same happens with a lustful image. Nowadays, you can't avoid them. They're everywhere. Billboards, magazines, TV, everything is covered with images of lust. You'll know that you're indulging in it when you repeat that image in your mind, when you recall it, when you use it as a basis for comparison, for memory, for fantasy. That is indulging. But if that image passes through and leaves no wake, it's gone. On the other hand, if that image comes up and you push it away, and you push it away, and you push it away, you're repressing. You see, this is a very delicate thing that no one can teach you, but you have to teach yourself to be conscious, to be awake, to be serene and relaxed. Then you'll get it. Your mind won't. Well, what is more dangerous, uh, indulging in impressions or suppressing them? They're equally dangerous. Both result in the same thing. Whether you indulge or repress, an ego is created, an ego is strengthened. Yes? That's like with uh, certain members of clergy who perform these unspeakable acts. How, do they, how could they possibly say one thing, perform a service or a ritual, and then privately they're doing all sorts of really negative things? I think it's because they're, they are oppressing so much that that energy comes out right. in the other really bad ways. It's, that's a good example. Another question? Yes. Um, I, th I think that I'm wondering if it's not a matter of focus as well. If when you turn your focus away from constantly feeling attacked by things and turn your focus onto the fact that the people uh, around you are, are, um, are lacking understanding, in a sense that what may come across as very ugly behavior is still a lack of understanding in a way. And I think. It, can make one feel a little bit less aggressed and less, again, internally focused on what you need to keep warding off. And more sort of sends out the sense of compassion where you just keep feeling that what's going on around you, that no matter how ugly it looks, is constantly like a lack of understanding. I think that in some ways can be a sort of protective force where, you know, it keeps you less vulnerable to suppressing, taking in, and more like, again, putting the focus out there on others where Again, you just understand that there are things that they don't understand. And yeah, you've made a very good point. That's the reason why uh, we emphasize bodhicitta so much. Bodhicitta, one part of that being compassion. And the problem is that we do get so self-centered and so defensive in ourselves. 
and we're always looking at other people as aggressors or as a threat to us. This is a problem. Compassion is definitely a component that needs to be present with the awakening of the consciousness. But compassion alone is not sufficient. What's necessary is full bodhicitta. And by that, it means not only compassion for other people, but comprehension of emptiness. It's in that combination, the bodhicitta, that provides that protective armor around the consciousness. And there, we've given several lectures about that, that explains that importance. It's too much to go into now. Let me address one more thing about that, though. This is a common danger in um, students who've learned some gnosis and have learned some transformation of impressions and how to be attentive, is that that student can start to develop a um, Gnostic personality. And what I mean is certain types of uh, internal attitudes or behaviors that we believe are Gnostic and that we feel are Gnostic but are just personality. And the result is we start to behave in a mechanical way, thinking that we're conscious. The danger there is that then we think we're transforming impressions, but we're not. We're being mechanical, but in a way that appears to us to be, super, to be genuine, but it's really superficial. This is something that's hard to explain, but it's a danger that we face as we're developing true conscious transformation of impressions. The, the clue to it is to discover this. When you're trying to be present and transform impressions, if you feel any sense of I, you're mistaken. You have a mistaken view. And it addresses what you brought up about compassion in other people. If you feel any sense of self, then your transformation will be flawed. The perfect transformation of impressions occurs when we are empty of self, when the personality is not in the way. And what's there is pure consciousness, which has no I. There is individuality, but beyond what we think of as individuality. And this is why in the revolution of the dialectic, Samael Amvor emphasized this. We cannot have a sense of self-esteem and transform impressions. We cannot. So for a student who's been working with this for a while, this becomes a clue to move past stages where we become stagnant in the practice, is to start watching. Is there a sense of I here? A sense of me? Me being a Gnostic? Or me being so-called serious? If there is, we're wrong. We're on a mistaken way. And we need to correct that. We need to empty ourselves of any sense of self to be pure perception to merely be conscious, no I. And that's experiential. The mind cannot do that. Only when the consciousness has become strong, we've given it a lot of force and strength, we can experience that, we can taste that. And it's beautiful. And it's in that state, when there is no false personality there, when we can really transform impressions that otherwise would have been indigestible to us. And when we can transform things that could be shocking or horrible. But we can come through that with serenity and love. Was there another question? Yeah. Now, strictly speaking, what is the meaning of compassion? Is it related with self-esteem? That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> what is the meaning of compassion, and is it related with self-esteem? Self-esteem is self-love, which is egotistical. Real compassion has no self. Real compassion is the force of Christ, which comes from the Sephira Chokmah, within which there is no I, no ego. There is only love, wisdom. For us to experience what true love is, our self cannot be in the way. Our ego. 
we often give the example that we can taste a glimmer, a very, very slight flavor of that form of love when we're a parent. Because a parent can experience, not always, but from time to time, can taste what that pure love that just wants to give and protect the child, what that feels like, what that tastes like. Not all parents experience it, and certainly most don't experience it very much. But as a parent, you can taste that flavor. Real compassion is that. It's a form of love that has no desire for self, but only wants what's good for others. But as we explained, the full, the full development of compassion is only in bodhicitta. And that's a very special Sanskrit word which refers to the fully developed awakened consciousness. Bodhicitta is the ethereal man who has fully developed the love of Christ. Selfless, pure love. Anyone can reach that, but we have to be willing to renounce our own self-interest. Is there another question? Okay. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord,